Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Aaron Basil, and on behalf of the entire Theorizing the Web Organizing Committee, I'd like to welcome you to today's episode of Theorizing the Web Presents for the Gram. Theorizing the Web Presents is our series of talks about technology and society. New episodes will stream live every other Wednesday, and we'll also announce some special events later this fall. If you'd like to discuss today's episode in real time or to submit questions for Q&A, please join us in the TTW Discord. You can find the Discord back channel by following the link in the YouTube description of this video and on our website, theorizingtheweb.org. Before we get started, I would like to thank the production team at the Museum of the Moving Image, without whom Theorizing the Web Presents truly would not be possible. I'd also like to thank my fellow organizing committee members, as well as all three of today's panelists. Finally, on behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for watching and participating. If you liked today's talk and you want to see more, please consider making a donation to both Theorizing the Web and Museum of the Moving Image. Every donation helps us to produce content like this, and we're grateful that we can do that with you. And with that, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. Jonathan Flowers. Jonathan is visiting assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Worcester State University. His research focuses on the effective ground of experience and embodiment through American pragmatism, phenomenology, and East Asian philosophy. He also focuses on pragmatist and cross-cultural approaches to machine intelligence, consciousness, and science and technology studies broadly. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Whitney. Today's episode features two new takes on visual culture in social media. In our first talk, The Secret Life of Pet Instagrams, uh, our pre presenter will demonstrate how pet content on Instagram provides joy and creates communities of care through processes of follower fragmentation. In Century of the Selfie, uh, our presenter will argue that while selfies may be relatively new, cultural anxiety about what a self should be is at least 100 years old and is often connected to the emergence of new media. Our first presenter, Dr. Jess Maddox, is an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism and, Create, uh, and Creative Arts at the University of Alabama. She researches visual social media, internet video culture, and pop culture. And of course, you can find her dogs on Instagram at the Mad Dogs, and you can find her on Twitter at uh, at Dr. Mad Maddox. Thanks, Jonathan, and very and thank you to Theorizing the Web for having uh, me today. I'm really excited to kick things off and uh, talk with you all today about my recent research, The Secret Life of Pet Instagram Accounts, Joy, Resistance, and Commodification in the Internet's Cute Economy. Now, you may be asking yourself, the secret life of what? <laughs> if you're not familiar, um, pet Instagrams are Instagram accounts run by participants on behalf of their pets. Um, so they involve a great deal of anthropomorphizing or asserting human characteristics to, well, non-human entities, in this case, pets. They're often written in the first person with uh, people writing, um, I mom took me for a walk today, not I took my dogs for a walk today. Um, not always, but that is one of the more common narrative uh, conventions and devices of these accounts. But pet Instagrams also exist on a massive spectrum. On one hand, we have um, low key or am seemingly amateur uh, users, these are just casual users who wanted to create an Instagram account for their pets. As you can see in the middle of the screen, that is the Instagram account for my dogs. Um, they have 60 followers. It's not a really big account. But this can go on the spectrum all the way up to pet influencers who have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers on Instagram. And have, I've included two examples here, Keeping Finn and Tuna Melts My Heart. While these accounts do post updates in the lives of these pets, they also do involve things we know about influencers, such as sponsorships, ads, paid promotions, and things of the like. The study I did, um, and I will, I'm about to get more into, did look at these low stakes uh, accounts, these people that just wanted to make an Instagram account for their pet because they thought it would be fun, funny, or some combination of uh, the two. 
So this research was born for me, um, gosh, about a year and a half ago now. Um, I obviously, as I've discussed already, have two dogs of my own. And one day I turned to my partner and said, you know, I think I'm going to make the dogs an Instagram account. And he said, don't do that. That's such a thing basic white girls do. So then being the feminist qualitative media researcher that I am, I immediately knew something was going on here because his opinion on pet Instagrams was something that a lot of people had, um, that they are very frivolous and just um, kind of silly and there's not really much there. Um, but as all researchers know, sometimes when things seem the most frivolous, we can gain some really fascinating insights from these everyday phenomenon. So I approached um, these accounts with these two questions of how are these accounts, or three questions, how are these accounts run? Um, why would somebody make an Instagram account for their pet? I knew why I wanted to as a person, but in terms of research, I wanted to know more. And finally, I just wanted to know what was going on here and how pets on the internet were being expressed and shared and shown and communicated in this way. And by approaching this study, it meant making the familiar strange. I already mentioned that pet Instagrams can seem kind of silly and kind of frivolous because they're just such an ordinary everyday thing, particularly when we think of these low stakes accounts of individuals making these accounts just for a couple dozen followers. But it's taps into something a lot larger that we know and joke about the internet and that's the internet is for cats. Uh, everyone has probably heard some variation of this between lol cats, grumpy cat, a uh, smudge lord from the woman yelling or the woman yelling at cat meme. Um, the internet is for cats, but it's also for dogs. It's also for dog rates and thoughts of a dog uh, or I've pet that dog. It's for viral videos of um, pandas getting in the way of someone cleaning their cage or when the pandemic first started, uh, the Georgia Aquarium walking the penguins through the uh, exhibitions so they could see all the other animals. We love animal content on the internet. And I was really interested in beginning to interrogate, well, why? Because yeah, people like looking at pictures of cute animals, but there's way more to it than that. And my research and some of the research I began to do into this uh, phenomenon of mediating our pets showed that, that earliest cave drawings show people drawing on caves, uh, what anthropologists have interpreted to be pets. Similarly, uh, historian Catherine Greer um, in her book, Pets in America, a History, discusses how in the 19th century, individuals used to write letters to each other in their pets' voices. So hearkening back to that anthropomorphizing that I talked about earlier, that this phenomenon of mediating our pets, turning them into media, writing in their voices, sharing them, is not remotely new, not remotely limited to Instagram, and has been going on for centuries. And so pet Instagram accounts are merely um, our 21st century manifestation of this. So I set out to do my work and I'm happy to talk more about methodology and Q&A, um, but very briefly, I interviewed about two dozen individuals for this project who ran pet Instagram accounts for their pets. They ranged in age from 19 to 57, and had a wide variety of occupations. And I include that here just to show that there's not necessarily just one type of person that would do this, that it can run the gamut. Um, across my participants, there were Instagrams uh, for 18 dogs, 10 cats, one horse, one rabbit, and one bearded dragon. And uh, human and pets were both given pseudonyms in order to protect their identities. And I found really three main things. The first was that we use pets to communicate about ourselves, even if we, the human, the owner, are absent from the picture or the account. And by this, well, one of my participants told me she made this pet Instagram account for her dog. And one day she posted this picture um, of her dog at the coffee shop with her. She was a college student. She had a test coming up. She was studying. And then a few days later, she was on campus and somebody said, hey, good luck on your test. I saw it on your dog's Instagram. 
So we're constantly communicating about ourselves, even if we are absent uh, from the account or from the, uh, the image in question. This really adds to literature we know about the extended self and adds to existing research on how we can push the boundaries of self-representation on social media. My research also found and really challenges this idea that the internet is for cats. I talked about this as that joke that we love cute content online, that we love talking, or talking about these animals, seeing cute pictures. But if the internet really was for cats, if we just outright loved seeing pictures of animals, why would my participants feel the need to segment off this content on a specific Instagram account that was not their primary human life focused one? And what I found is that many of my participants described that when you post on social media, your life needs to be holistic or your the representation of your life needs to be holistic. It needs to show numerous things that are going on. It should not just focus on one thing. Um, when they focus on one thing, people can get the wrong impression about what their life or lives may be about. So in order to not annoy people, uh, my participants would create these pet Instagram accounts where their followers and friends could opt in. That was the phrase that came up over and over again in my research. To know that what they would be seeing from this account would be 100% about this one thing. Now, I didn't say I didn't say this. This is what my participants told me. But um, many of them <laughs> said they wished people would do similar things to things like their gym going or even their children to segment off that content in a specific place and on their main page present a more holistic version of their lives. I didn't say it, that's just what my participants said. <laughs> but then lastly, um, my last finding was rather optimistic. Um, and I'm always willing to insert a little optimism into internet research because we know um, the internet can be a crazy negative toxic space. Um, and my research found something really opt rather optimistic and that is we're willing to take care of each other online. When I asked my participants uh, what they wanted people to get out of these accounts. They all talked about joy. They all talked about just inserting a little bit of care in the world, about, in, about just making people happy. Many of them um, told me that Instagram is a place where it's even now, Instagrams can be coming all about politics or somebody's already trying to sell you something, whether it's um, uh, you know, a multi-level marketing scheme, or <laughs> there's influencers, something of the likes. And they said, one of my participants said, and I quote, if there's one corner of the internet that can be pure, it's pet Instagrams. And to me, this reflects this idea that people are willing to work in meaningful ways to make platforms habitable. We are willing, people are willing to work in ways to carve out little spaces to make their experiences online enjoyable when that joy may not readily be there. Now this by, me, by no means solves any of the internet's problems, but it does show how people work in ways that matter to them to carve out these little spaces and take care of themselves and take care of others amidst what my participants described as the negativity, the toxicity of internet culture. But it's important to also note that even though my participants talked about pet Instagrams being pure, it's not necessarily, divorced from the broader socio-cultural context of the internet. Some of my participants did tell me they started these accounts because they wanted their, their pets to become insta-famous, to become pet influencers, realized it's a lot harder than they think and gave up on it. Others told me that often, they, oftentimes they would be messaged by um, small boutiques and companies asking if uh, they would be willing to model their products and trying to necessarily trying to bring them into these entre entrepreneurial dynamics that are so common on Instagram. So while these pet Instagram accounts are a way to find joy and make spaces habitable, very much reminding me of Michelle de Certeau's, uh tactics that people work to make spaces habitable for themselves and others, it's not immune. It's constantly in a give and take and a struggle with and against broader socio-cultural dynamics. So what's next for me? Um, well, if you want to know more about this project, happy to talk more about it in Q&A. 
And you can also read the article, which is out now in New Media and Society under the same name. I am also writing a book. I am also writing a uh, book on pet Instagram. My proposal is currently under external peer review and hoping I'm hoping to hopefully have a book contract by the end of this year. Um, my book is tentatively titled, This is Fine, Making Do and Making Meaning in Pet and Animal Social Media. And this explores many of the themes I talked about uh, in this presentation today, uh, as well as others that I'd be happy to discuss as well. And lastly, please keep in touch. My contact info is there on the screen. Happy to uh, take questions. Feel free to email me, uh, tweet at me, or always follow my dogs on Instagram. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Jess. Uh, our next presenter, uh, Emily Steinkamp, is a PhD candidate in journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. Her work focuses on social media and subjectivity. Hi, um, I was just having some Wi-Fi issues. So forgive me if I'm a little slow. Um, let's see. So uh, what I'm talking about today is my, this is actually my dissertation research and I recently um, defended my dissertation proposal. So I'm working on this right now. Um, and the talk is called Century of the Selfie on excessive self relations as social problems. So. Um, I'm really interested in this idea, seemingly very contemporary idea that um, social media are to blame for a sort of generational narcissism. Um, the social media make us sad, stupid, and narcissistic. Perhaps there's a narcissism epidemic, uh, according to you know certain psychologists. Narcissism in social media should we be afraid? Um, this there's a sort of common senseness to this notion. Uh, because of the ways in which social media allows us and encourages us to sort of broadcast every little thing about ourselves. And certainly because of the ways in which sort of personal branding and promotional culture is woven into the fabric of social media, um, perhaps uh, social media is to blame for a certain kind of uh, malformed relationship to the self or even a pathological one, which is so often sort of the implication with uh, these assertions of narcissism um, and the sort of search to connect narcissism with social media use. Um, and I'm especially interested in the ways, the way in which selfies and selfie taking sort of figure into this, um, this common social idea uh, where if there is to be a discussion about sort of the ways in which social media um, are harming the way that we relate to ourselves, usually that's going to be illustrated by um, an image of a person taking a selfie, usually a young woman, as we saw with the Time Magazine cover. These are just, this is just a few examples of the kind of media that um, has been circulating regarding sort of how selfies um, are out of place, are a psychological complex, all these things. So I wanted to think about whether this concept that social media are creating a generation of narcissists, um, if it's quite as contemporary as it might seem to be initially, um, or whether we can find sort of a, a longer history of it. One of the things that I think is really interesting about um, this group of ideas is that it's not just sort of a, a popular commentary or um, a common cultural criticism that says that, you know, social media and narcissism are linked and they're sort of affecting the fabric of society in this negative way. But there's also like a growing body of psychological academic literature that's um, really seeking to connect selfie taking uh, and, and different kinds of sort of psychological illnesses and pathologies, certainly with narcissism, but also with other sort of traits uh, such as sociopathy and um, Machiavellianism. That's what this study about uh, the dark triad of personality traits is. Um, and sort of as this discourse builds in these official channels, uh, I want to really try to think about why that connection between social media usage, selfie taking in particular, and like a, a pathological or malformed 
just a just plain wrong relationship to the self um, is so sort of intuitive. So why might that be? So my research questions, um, how did the idea that social media have created a generation of narcissists come to be intelligible in the 21st century? Um, to what extent have waves of new media inspired similar moral panics around notions of selfhood and mediation in the 20th century? Um, and you know, how did it come to pass that self-imaging and selfie taking became emblematic of a certain kind of digitally mediated narcissism, a digitally mediated sort of pathology? And what other ways um, might a historical perspective on these social problems um, allow us to understand uh, the ways or allow us to understand like a proper relationship to the self? So those ideas are always shifting. Um, so the framework that I'm using to undertake this study, uh, I work from a cultural studies perspective um, and cultural studies, according to Larry Grossberg, its concern is always contexts and conjunctures and um, sort of in that line of conjunctural analysis, which sort of tries to look at um, history as a terrain of struggle uh, and sort of looking at the different contradictions that um, characterize historical moments. Uh, I really wanna examine more closely the ways in which mediated self-branding is, is encouraged and valorized on so many levels today. Uh, at the same time that, you know, too much social media use is, um, is decried and criticized. So why is it that, you know, we're encouraged to do this thing on the one hand and, and we're um, criticized for doing it on the other hand? And, uh, you know, is there a historical precedent for this? Because certainly the taking of self images is not, um, not unique to this moment, even if the sort of particular technologies that allow for the wide circulation of selfies um, is. So the way that I'm approaching this is to ask, is to look closer, more closely um, at the way that narcissism has been understood as a social problem in the American 20th century, because it's, certainly not just a concern of the sort of 21st century, the last two uh, decades. Um, and I see sort of a couple of periods where there's a, um, an increase in cultural anxiety about the nature of the individual, of the self. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these periods, but basically I see them sort of following Freud's initial coining of the term narcissism in 1914, sort of up to um, the end of the 20s. And then again, in the middle of the century, following sort of the, the height of the new left social movements, um, feminist movements and uh, civil rights movement. And then again, sort of immediately after that, as there's a shift toward neoliberal economic policy that also carries with it these sort of cultural values um, around an entrepreneurial ideal of selfhood. So this idea that the self should be enterprising, self-reliant and, um, you know, that it's the self's responsibility to sort of mediate or not mediate, but just succeed to survive. So this, this initial period is really interesting to me because of the way in which um, Freud is sort of writing about narcissism in a way where it's already got these sort of gendered and sexual politics. He sees narcissism as an illness, uh, mostly falling to women or if it falls to men, then uh, they are homosexual men. So there's already this sort of sexual and gendered politics that I think um, continues as narcissism sort of moves through the American consciousness as a problem. And at the same time, in the 19 teens, we also see sort of the beginning of uh, popular photography, 19 teens and 20s, um, the sort of democratization of photography, uh, mainly coming through you know, affordable cameras like the, the Kodak Brownie camera. Um, but at the same time, there are all these different sort of social changes that are happening in the 19 teens and 20s. And we also see sort of the rise of radio and um, increasing concern over the rise of fascism in Europe and sort of the ways in which mass media can be used to manipulate um, populaces on a mass scale. Uh, at home, you know, we see increased interest in sort of communications research, my field, um, because researchers want to know, the government wants to know, like, how can mass media be used to um, affect the way that a population thinks? So I think sort of the through line through all of these different um, areas of 
commentary, all these different literatures, is that there's a fear about the permeability of the individual. Um, perhaps people are too susceptible to media influence. Um, if fascism can be fomented in Europe because of you know, manipulation of media. Uh, and so I think that this is a really interesting period for thinking about like why narcissism is being conceived of as a problem at the same time. And at the same time that, um, that photography is becoming more of a leisure activity. So we see again, a sort of high watermark of interest in American narcissism and sort of the, the problem of the American individual, how the individual relates to itself, themself, um, sort of after, I, th I think, the peak of um, the New Left social movements in 1968. Um, you see Christopher Lash's book is, is published, I think, in 1978, The Culture of Narcissism. Um, and this is a book that really sort of um, criticizes what what Lash sees is like the, the decadence of the American individual an excessive interest in the self, which, you know, in turn uh, speaks to a general sort of social malaise, um, a social dysfunction. And I think there's a sort of clear through line from this kind of interest in narcissism, the me decade, this um, Tom Wolfe cover story, which is also from the 70s. Um, there's a clear through line that kind of has to do with the ways in which uh, sort of hippies on the one hand are insisting on personal freedom, free love, sort of uh, experimentation with their own consciousness, and then sort of political sects uh, or political movements of different sorts during this period. Um, people of color, women, queer people are all demanding sort of personal, um, the inclusion of their in individuals and or their identities into the sphere of politics. And all of these politics are being articulated through sort of personal experience. We have consciousness raising, all of these things. So there's an increased interest in uh, the way in which individual experience um, is important to articulating an identity uh, at the same time that sort of narcissism is understood, or not at the same time, but sort of right before narcissism is understood to be uh, a social problem yet again. So why would that be? Um, and then sort of the final period that I think is really interesting uh, kind of follows right after, but it's this period in the, the 80s, sort of early 90s, where neoliberal sort of economic policies are shifting uh, responsibility from the state to the individual in terms of social services, at the same time that um, self-esteem is being sort of posited as like this middle ground between too much interest in the self to an excessive interest in the self, narcissism, or not enough interest in the self, because low self-esteem is going to be, you know, conceived of as the problem that, um, you know, women need to solve in this Gloria Steinem text. The Revolution from Within is a book that sees, you know, the problems of patriarchy as in part uh, affecting the individual. So there's also this really interesting sort of moment with this California task force to promote self-esteem and personal and social responsibility where self-esteem is, is understood as this uh, sort of key connection between, um, or this key sort of concept where if there's a deficit of self-esteem, then all of these maladaptive uh, social behaviors are going to flourish instead. So self-esteem, the proper relationship to the self, not too much, not too little regard for the self um, is, uh, is posited as a solution to social problems. So, um, yeah, these are, I think these are all periods where we see um, sort of ideals of how the self relate, should relate to itself shifting and where we can sort of trace um, different understandings of the self through like through media objects on the one hand and through um, media panics and new media sort of moral panics on the other hand. So what I would like, what I'm studying to kind of get this project together, um, vernacular or amateur self portraits um, through time, artistic self-portraits as well, because there's sort of a huge amount of experimentation that's happening in the art world um, and sort of more and more self-portraiture is sort of being um, like the body art movement in the 70s and 80s, feminist body art, sort of performance art, all these different ways of focusing on the self as sort of a canvas for exploring social issues um, are all sort of ongoing. And then I'm also looking at um, advice and self-help literature to uh, see where 
people are articulating sort of personal problems with uh, self-presentation or self-mediation and how you know commentators, advice givers uh, sort of direct people to correct, um, correct those problems. And then of course the, the cultural commentary, which is what I'm sort of most familiar with and what I've commented on the most in this talk um, to see sort of how people from different fields, popular commentators, academics, um, are understanding sort of the individual as an American problem or as a place where the problems of American society are, um, should be addressed, is, are most properly addressed. Um, and these are some of the things that I've read to get me to this point. So I welcome any uh, questions. Thank you, Emily. Um, so now we're going to bring both Emily and Jess back together for some Q&A, and it looks like we've got some questions coming in already. All right, uh, so our first question. Uh, so the point about community or about using pets, or this is for Jess, the point about using pets to communicate about or on behalf of ourselves is really interesting. It's sort of auto ventriloquism. I wonder what such a practice allows people to say, do, feel, or be that may not be possible on our main accounts. That's a great question. And I love that term. Um, that was, that's a great term to, to the question asker. Um, and I think you're onto something. I think it does, a lot of my participants discussed um, that talking in their pet's voice was a way for them to be silly and playful. And for some of them, they discussed how serious their everyday lives have to be, whether it's their job or um, the seriousness of all the problems going on in the world right now. Um, so this was just a fun, silly little thing where they could be lighthearted and uh, be fun and um, kind of focus on communicating that side of themselves over um, maybe feeling the need to perform uh, more serious things on their own personal social media or in their everyday lives. Uh, this is a question for Emily. Welcome back, Emily. Thank you. Um, so some people have posited a difference uh, between the selfie versus a self-portrait. Uh, do you hold a distinction there? And if so, how does it play with respect to narcissism? Um, I think there's certainly a, a difference. Uh, the selfie is sort of a network self-portrait. And I think that's sort of the thing that makes it most interesting for our purposes. Um, uh, sorry, uh, but the distinction, well, what I'm interested in is sort of how these cultural anxieties about self-imaging have developed over sort of a historical period. So if there's obviously like a technological difference, but it's not as if self-portraits sort of in the first place were not viewed in social ways or circulated in social ways. So I'm just really looking to see, because I, my sense is that there's cultural anxiety from the very beginning since self-portraiture, there's something like unsettling about it on a cultural level. Um, and I'm interested in learning more about that. And so this is, this is a question for me uh, that kind of bridges both uh, presentations. So I was, I'm curious the, the degree of overlap between your, uh, between your presentation, Emily, and Jess's presentation. That is, uh, could, to what degree uh, are our pet Instagrams uh, kind of narcissism by proxy uh, via our pets? And to, to what degree uh, running a pet Instagram it plays into these kinds of fears about narcissism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and some of my earlier work uh, or some of my earliest work actually dove into selfies and a little bit about narcissism. Um, as well. 
Um, so I, I love all things visual social media, basically. And so I think I wouldn't necessarily call it narcissism by proxy, but I, I would agree that I'm thinking back to what many of my participants told me about how your social media profile should be holistic, show many things that's going on in your day-to-day -day life. And if you're just showing one type of content, whatever that by me, whatever that may be, like maybe you're the type of person only posting selfies about themselves, like every day, like get up, go to the gym, go, uh, get up, here's my going to work selfie, you know, just whatever that could be, I think contributes to this perception um, that people feel like they have to present this holistic um, version of themselves as to not feel narcissistic in whatever way that may be. So I do think there is some, some um, maybe fears about narcissism um, going on on here that's worth exploring further in that in being afraid to post too much of one specific type of content, um, people may, you know, maybe there's a perception on, uh, that this is all I care about, that this is the only thing that matters to me, and, the, and linking to that obsessive, um, the accusations of obsessive self-love that Emily uh, so excellently talked about. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree, and I think any place where um, we're talking about influencers, we're implicitly having this conversation about, like, how is it proper to relate to the self privately, mm -hmm. and how is it proper to relate to the self publicly, mm -hmm. and then is it like actually okay, you know, according to whom, by which cultural standards to monetize sort of the way that we interact with the world, to monetize ourselves as a brand. And I think part of what I'm tracing in my study is sort of the increasing emphasis on self-branding. And um, that's part of like a neoliberal uh, subjectivity. If you're good enough at being yourself, then you can make money on it and you can survive that way. Um, social media provides this really unique, um, outlet for that to happen. Um, and I think that sort of the pet Instagram, if there are pet Instagram influencers, then that's still going to be dealing with these same questions of like, how is it proper to reveal my own personality by way of my pet's persona? Or how is it proper to like um, mediate my pet and myself? Mm -hmm. nope. There's my <laughs> pet, they wanna join. <laughs> So uh, another question for Emily. So thinking about neoliberalism and the privatized self as the historical and cultural context for the emergence of the internet, how's that conjecture baked into the design of technology we use today? Uh, and so the question is thinking specifically of the construction of the user of social media and whether uh, narcissism might be part of that inherently. Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. It reminds me of, um, Alice Marwick's work on uh, her like ethnography of um, Silicon Valley, where she sort of writes about the self-promotional culture, just of the people that create um, all these different kinds of apps and social media um, platforms, and how um, Twitter in particular is one of these places where you can sort of metricate your social connections, you can um, see where you stand in a hierarchy of, um, of social connectedness, and where connectedness is like uh, becomes itself a kind of currency, this networked self. And I think what's interesting about that book is that it points to the ways in which like Web 2.0 particularly encourages this kind of like racking up of social connections, um, which is also sort of what allows influencers to become influential. It's like they're followed because they have followers. They're popular because you know, they managed to attract all this attention, therefore they're worthy of more attention or something like this. And uh, I think that a lot of that is absolutely built into the designs. There's no necessary, um, it's not like necessarily the case that social media should show, for example, how many likes or followers um, a given user or post has. You see that now with the Instagram thing where they're not showing the number so much anymore. Instagram is really taking on um, this, this role of like trying to manage the health of its users because it's acknowledged, it's understood that like, if you don't get enough likes on your post, it's gonna make you feel bad. So I think that the metricization, the use of metrics is certainly like a part of that conversation. Um, and I would also like encourage anyone thinking about this question to think about like web 1.0 and to think about 
earlier sort of versions of um, social media message boards particularly kind of spring to mind. Obviously there are still like metrics involved there, but it was a completely different sort of structure, no feed, just topics. Everyone's posting about the topic. Um, these were still ways for people to find each other um, and be social. It's just no longer like the dominant model. So of course, like you can point to, they're like probably prominent personalities um, on message boards, for example, but there have been all of these other like pre-web 2.0 um, social structures that have developed online. And not all of them look the way that um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook do. Not all of them are, were monetized in the same way. Um, and none of them gave rise to the influencer as we know it today, like in quite the same way, because I think the affordances are different. That's actually really interesting. So I wanted to come back to something that Jess mentioned at the beginning of her talk that uh, her partner described uh, pet Instagrams as such a, a basic white woman thing to do. Uh, and I wanted to, to bring uh, the question of race into this, right? So to what degree do, does race inform uh, your research, Jess? And uh, parallel to that for Emily, to what degree is narcissism viewed differently uh, depending on the race of the social media user? That is, do we view uh, some, some racialized engagements with social media as, as more narcissistic or less? Uh, and conversely, do we see more um, racialized perceptions of pet ownership via pet selfies? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great question. So, I have to say, I think if my partner knew that I would bring up this anecdote, anecdote every time I, I would give this talk now, he'd probably wish he never, would have never said it. It's very supportive of my project. Um, but my participants did skew very white um, in, this, um, in this research. I did have um, two, two of my 23 participants are identified as African-American and I had one participant um, who was a Chinese British uh, citizen. And that does say something to me that maybe this is something um, related to whiteness. I also do think um, it is also very much tied to socioeconomic status, right? Pet ownership in general, how you have to have leisure time, expendable or expendable income um, and things of the like. My book does dive into this further. The, the book I'm currently writing um, and this chapter where I talk about pet Instagrams, I actually marry it to a case that is seemingly the opposite, and that is Pepe the Frog, um, where I talk about um, joy. And I'm not trying to apologize for white supremacists or anything by any means, but this argument, um, when I did a discursive analysis of Pepe the Frog from Reddit and 4chan, this battle for Pepe was very much um, for his soul that happened around the 2016 election was very much rooted in this idea of a frog, this reptilian, this animal, as who could enjoy him, who got to enjoy him. And then he became co-opted as this racist, uh, anti-Semitic, horrible hate, uh, hate, um, uh, hate symbol, excuse me. And so that when we start looking at how people use animals more broadly online to have this conversation about their images, we start, I, I start getting a little bit more into the thicket of these um, larger socio, uh, social issues on the web. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's really interesting, Jess. I think in terms of like the racial politics of narcissism, I think it's very much um, it's very much sort of present in uh, certainly the history or the historical reception of narcissism. Um, what I think is like very interesting about sort of Freud's original conception of it is that he says it's like an illness for women and gay men. So there's always this sort of conception uh, when we talk about narcissism as an illness of like, who is it that's too interested in themselves? It's not necessarily going to be white men or straight men. Um, and if we look at sort of the history of backlash against mm -hmm. self-portraiture and even selfie taking, we see that there's absolutely an undue amount of criticism that falls to, um, I would say, women and people of color, which comes from, uh, 
I would say, you know, centuries of like racial oppression that says a, a racialized body is not like worthy of a high amount of self-regard. That's part of what is so like powerful about the civil rights movement, um, insisting on black is beautiful, for example. So I think that like, as the self becomes politicized and as race is understood as a politicized identity over the course of the 20th century, um, these accusations of narcissism are absolutely gonna fall on racial lines um, and are not going to be accorded to white men in the same way that they're accorded to women and people of color and queer people. Thank you. Uh, so Emily, I have a, another question for you. So who decides what constitutes an artistic self-portrait and how does that affect what is and isn't uh, considered narcissism? So where do community guidelines like Twitch's constant battle against body painters play into people's relationship to mediated narcissism? And here I'd, I'd also add uh, Instagram's uh, censorship algorithms and, and the way that it was proven to be fat phobic in particular kinds of ways. Um. I mean, I'm not sure exactly like the contemporary platforms policies around artistic versus personal self portraits. That I couldn't speak to because I just don't know those policies offhand. Um, but I would say that historically this distinction between like um, an artistic self portrait and a amateur self portrait is one that is really sort of bound up in like archival practices. And I'm interested because I haven't done all the archival work yet um, to see whether there are going to be like distinctions between personal self-portraits and artistic self-portraits um, in 20th century history. But um, one of the things that I think, yeah, no, that's all I have. All right, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask is uh, beyond my initial question regarding uh, the interconnections between your two presentations, uh, what do both of you see as the future of your work? A great question. Emily, do you want to? <laughs> um, the future of my work? I think that sort of this question of how to relate to the self, how the self should be, is going to continue to be like a relevant question. Um, and so I'm really interested in the ways that like media is figured into that question and where media is seen as like the way that something wrong gets in. Um, one of the, actually this is a thought that I had for the last question about like artistic versus amateur self-portraits, but one of the things that I've seen in my studies of self-portraiture like in a longer history going back before the 20th century, is that, you know, some of the very earliest forms of self-portraiture were seen to be sort of sacrilegious or perhaps as an affront. And it's artists who are allowed to sort of play with that convention. Um, and it's artists who are first, obviously, given the resources and sort of um, social esteem to, to play with the form of the self-portrait. And so I think, a lot of what we see as backlash against the selfie comes from like the democratization of a form that has for a long time been considered like not okay on some level, even if it's not something that someone would necessarily say like it's wrong to make a self portrait. I think there's this really deeply held sort of cultural um, uh, discomfort with the, the sort of what, like what it means to mediate the self. Um, and I see, the future of my work will have to do with influencers. I think that there's a lot to sort of understand about influencing influencers as like a new labor form. Um, and one that, that is really uniquely 21st century that kind of marries the personal expression and branded expression, promotional expression are all kind of jumbled up together in this, this way that is like pretty uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, so that that is like something that I would like to continue to study. Um, and sort of situate in this history. Yeah, similarly, I'm really interested in, um, in definitely exploring where we go from here. I, I mentioned I'm working on this book project. Um, so my, my immediate future is doing, uh, conducting interviews with um, 
this time people beyond just those who make um, these kind of low stakes pet Instagram accounts. I'm interviewing pet influencers. I'm interviewing um, a lot of animal welfare and conservation activists right now as well. Um, because one of the issues that has come up in my research and you know I'm, I'm not an animal studies scholar by any means, I'm not a conservationist, but um, how these cute viral videos of uh, slow lorises or um, chimpanzees uh, or lemurs, they're so decontextualized, which is a much larger problem of uh, content we share on the internet in general, that it's always removed from its context. It's always, it doesn't have, people don't always have the backgrounds to fully comprehend what's going, what they're seeing or reading or understanding, um, which, you know, isn't anybody's fault of their own. It's just a byproduct of the internet. And when people see these cute videos, they often then try to go out and own them as pets themselves. And so this is on Instagram in particular, this is really problematic with um, sea and river otters, where mm -hmm. in some countries um, it's perfectly legal to keep these animals as pets, but it's not in the United States. And then people go out and try to get these animals as pets um, because they saw it look cute on Instagram. Um, so that's one of the areas um, I hope to take this research. And the other, um, one of the other things my book um, hopefully argues is that yes, we have on one hand, the internet is for cats, but there's also this competing discourse that we hear a lot of that the internet is garbage or a dumpster fire or a hellscape or, you know, to choose which, whichever one you want. And so my book, instead of trying to position those as diametrically opposed, I want to marry them together and explore how sometimes the cats are the garbage or the garbage is the cats. And that this, yes, this does mean problematizing the cute stuff on the internet. Um, but also understanding how um, sometimes the cute stuff isn't divorced from, can't be divorced from the internet's most problematic aspects um, as well. Uh, we were mentioning moderation policies a second ago. One of the images I showed in my PowerPoint of keeping Finn, uh, that pet influencer account randomly had a photo of their dog removed a few months ago for violating Instagram's terms of service the owner, the owner appealed and said, what, he's sitting in front of a mountain. How does this violate Instagram's terms of service? And Instagram responded and just doubled down once again and said, nope, violated terms of service, stays off the site. And while this is a seemingly inconsequential moment of a you know picture of a dog getting removed, reminds me very much of Facebook's most infamous content moderation blunder where they removed the um, terror of war or napalm girl photo several years ago for supposedly violating China, uh, child pornography standards. Once again, Facebook didn't admit they did wrong, but doubled down on this decision. So when what both of these instances show, one is obviously way more uh, important than the other. You know, a, the terror of war photograph is much more important than a random dog's picture on Instagram, but underscores this idea that when these platforms double down on their content moderation blunders, they're arguing it's work, things are working exactly like they're supposed to, that they haven't done anything wrong, which gets at this much larger issue. Um, a lot of brilliant social media and tech scholars um, are discussing right now, um, Sarah Roberts, Sophia Noble, um, look at, at how the problem is that this garbage is baked into the platforms at its most fundamental levels. Thank you. Um, so my last question is for, for Emily, uh, and it has to do with the politics of representation. So to what degree does uh, do selfies or selfies constructed as narcissistic play into the, the politics of, of representation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, gender representation, uh, gender performance via the selfie and how, uh, and the ways in which a selfie can make visible ones uh, gendered identity? Sure. Um, you know, that question, ooh, can I remember it? It's making me think of Christine Jorgensen, who was a, a trans woman in like the 40s or 50s, whose transition like happened mainly via media. She was like a magazine cover story type of thing that happened. Um, so this is this really early uh, instance of technology like facilitating this new relationship to the body and to the self and sort of asserting a different kind of identity. Um, and I think, you know, with selfie taking, 
my work is not really so interested in saying like it's good or it's bad. I'm just really, I'm more interested in the ways that, um, that it's understood socially as like a social problem and why that might be. But I think, you know, just experientially, there's obviously something um, powerful and potent in the act of taking a selfie. I took one just before this talk. Um, there's, there's something to it about the way that you can control the way that you're imaged um, that I think feels really uh, particular and feels really like desirable in a lot of ways. So I think that the fact that that technology is, is ubiquitous really allows for a different way of relating to the self. There's all kinds of um, scholarship that is sort of about this. Uh, I think where you run into like ways that trouble that pleasure or place like, yeah, things that trouble that that pleasure of, of controlling the images when these selfies are networked and released into the world um, mm -hmm. and where they can be understood as evidence of your, uh, your narcissism if there's something going on in the background that you didn't realize was going on. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you're taking one in public and people are whatever, judging you or, or laughing at you or whatever happens with that. So um, I think that it's a really complicated question in terms of like what the political stance or the political results of um, these, these network self images are, but um, I'm, I'm interested to, to keep studying it and keep learning more. Thank you, Emily. And so I'd like to take this moment to thank both Dr. Jess Maddox and Emily Steinkamp for their wonderful presentations. Uh, the next TTW Presents will be uh, on Wednesday, October 7th at an alternate time, uh, 10 a.m. and will be called uh, Diminishing Returns. Uh, and we hope to see you all there. So once again, thanks to, to Dr. Jess Maddox, Maddox Emily Steinkamp, and all of you for attending uh, TTW Presents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.